Welcome to another episode of DD on the Spot. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Johnson. And before I get to our guests here today, I'd like to remind everyone that if you enjoy this content, to please leave a like and subscribe down below. I'd greatly appreciate it. We have Caroline De- Dimasquita. Did I get it right? You did. Okay, I got it right, everyone. So that I was worried about this one because everyone knows that I struggle sometimes with last names or name that in general with people on the podcast. But hey, I got that right. She's a wellness athlete as well as a wellness coach. She's a hormone health lifestyle coach and a posing coach, which I mean, believe me, I love having posing coaches on, but we'll get into that in a little bit. And she's coming to us all the way from Georgia. She's, I mean, I always say... I usually have worse weather than the guests that I have on, but we are blessed that today we have a guest that has a little bit of warmer weather than I have. So, you know, it's it, it's nice to finally have that. But most importantly, she's our current guest. Caroline, thank you so much for coming on. It's my pleasure, Ryan. I'm excited to talk with you. Oh, absolutely. Me as well. But I mean, the weather out here is about, you know, 80 degrees. But I always got to ask, what's the weather like in Georgia today? I think we're in the high 80s. I haven't been outside since my fasted cardio this morning. So when I was out at 8 a.m. It was about uh, 75 degrees. Hey, well, you know that's the, that's the only time when you can really go out. And I mean, before I mean, before we basically just suppress everyone with our weather woes, because believe me, I'm trying I'm planning on doing a whole podcast of just winter weather in Minnesota, and just you know that's that's a whole 15 hour podcast basically that's going to take me for forever to do. But why don't you give us your backstory and what really inspired and what motivates you to you know get in shape and how that led to where you're at right now? Sure. So I always start at the beginning. And I grew up on a farm in Northwest Ohio. So growing up, I was always like out and about the skinny farm girl had decent genetics that I didn't put on a lot of weight. And through high school into college, I still maintain a pretty lean physique, but I wasn't really lifting or training. And it was about my senior year of college that I got interested in weight training. I took a female strength and conditioning course. And learned about bodybuilding. And I was like, huh, it's kind of interesting. And I started doing just your normal like bench, deadlift, squats. And after I graduated from Ohio State, I started in a sales job. And so outside sales, I was driving the truck, you know, eight hours a day, going to different customers, out and about, eating lunches out. And I was starting to gain weight. I was unhappy with myself. I'd actually put on 20 pounds after college, not in college. And that was from the sales job. And I decided, you know, enough was enough. My genetics would play against me eventually if I didn't reel it in because a lot of my family is overweight, um, has some prediabetes, some heart conditions. And I definitely didn't want to have that for myself. So I was like, you know, I'm going to look into this bodybuilding thing. This was in 2015. And I just reached out to the gal who had taught my course and she actually was a coach still is. And she was like, yeah, I'll, I'll help you do a prep for your first show. So it was the beginning. It was in the middle of 2015. I started a 16 week prep for NPC figure and did a show in St. Louis and I placed last. And it was just like the last three weeks or so, I was kind of getting burnt out. I'm like, I'm never doing this again. This is awful. I felt all alone by myself. And part of the reason that I got into bodybuilding, it wasn't just for like the extreme weight loss, but it was also like a self exploration process. And I actually became very spiritual during that process. I started going to church again, starting doing my Bible studies again and learning more about like my inner self. And through that process, the last few weeks of the prep, I realized that, you know, I just need to give it my all. This is the first prep. I don't necessarily have to do it again. Well, come show day and that weekend, my best friend drove out for my show and it was just her and I at the show. And even though I didn't place well, it was just like a super cool experience being on stage, talking with other competitors backstage and then talking with sponsors and different brands that are part of the industry. I was like, I just like the industry. And I decided to compete again. And so in spring of 2016, I did my second show. Ended up placing second, which qualified me for national shows. And I'm like, you know, why don't we just try a national show? At that time, it was like, realistically, my physique was nowhere where it should be, in my opinion, to be on a national stage. But I qualified. I had the money to do it. So I went to Junior USA's in Charleston in 2016 in last callouts. And 
the, the feedback that I gotten from people was you have a great frame. You have a really good potential in the sport. You just need more time in the sport. And I took that to heart and decided to take a longer off season. And during the off season, I actually had a lot of highs and lows as far as understanding health and fitness, which we can dive into. But that was something that in bodybuilding, I think a lot of people don't understand is that there's a fine line and balance in maintaining long-term health with sustainable results versus just short-term goals and short-term results. Because I've experienced some health issues myself that I've had to overcome. And I actually um, believe it was March of 2018, I joined on with Mountain Dog, John Meadows, and he coached me in part of my off season. And we decided last year was going to be the year to step back on stage again. So I did a local show in um, Atlanta. And then the following weekend, I did Junior USAs again. So the Atlanta show, I won the overall for figure. And then at Junior USAs, I placed fourth in a figure class B, which I was super excited about. Best package I've ever brought to stage. And I was just thrilled that I felt like the past three and a half, four years, I'm actually progressing in the sport. And I'm, you know, super young in the sport. There's a lot of these competitors out there that are starting at age 16, 17. And they are going to have a huge potential as long as they stay focused on the long term and not just getting the short term results. So that's a kind of long story short when it comes to bodybuilding from the past four years. Then they announced wellness. And I'd actually spoken with some of the judges last year to get feedback on what to change about my physique. I'm always trying to improve myself. I think that's the biggest part of the sport people should look at is how am I going to improve myself from point A to point B to point C. And the judge's feedback was, well, you have a great frame. Once again, I had great conditioning, but if you're going to do figure, you either need to bring down your legs or bring up your whole upper body. And I was just at this point where I was pretty deterred because of having such a hard time growing my upper body, my shoulders. I was getting injured in my chest, trying to train chest and shoulders more. My back wasn't growing how I needed it to. And when they announced wellness, I was like, maybe this is the division for me. So I've actually been focusing on training for wellness since it was announced last fall. I had a surgery this spring, which I had to take some time off for, but I'm now in prep. I'm about, it'll be when this is launched, I think I'll be about five and a half weeks out from my show planning to go into junior USAs again. And the goal is to bring home that IFBB pro card for wellness. And that that's just such a great story. And I got to say the moment that you started talking, I was like, I don't think she's originally from Georgia with that, with that. But then I was like, yeah, she's from, she's from Ohio because yeah, I've had some, believe me, I've had some of those Southern accents on where I'm literally like, okay, I might have to do subtitles down below just so that people can, can understand what they're saying. But yeah, that's just such a, such a great story. And I'm glad that you, you're talking about, you know, how you took such a long break in between shows. Cause so many people, they are just willing to take, you know, like the, like when we're talking about, you know, like how to have a long and healthy and sustained career. So many people are willing to take, you know, the shortcuts just to be able to, you know, just for that next year so that they can can be you know in, in better placing and then it ruins their health long term so I'm glad that you took all those years off and that's just such so great because I think so many people are, that I've had on the show especially are ashamed if they talk about you know like oh I took I took such a long time off in between shows because they feel like they have to be always you know get, either getting ready for a show or just it's kind of like an, a never-ending cycle of just either prepping or you know in, your, in their off season so I really appreciate that you say that because I mean so many people don't understand that you know the body needs a rest too. Also, if you're going to, if you're going to grow it, I mean, just constantly being in season or off season, it's, it's not, it's not really that healthy, but a question that I love to ask everyone, because I always say, if you were to walk into a gym with a hundred people, there's a hundred different ways as to how those people got into shape, whether it comes down to their diet, their nutrition, how many reps they do, what exercises they do. So many little things add up to that overall package that people end up seeing. And I mean, I always say, if you were to walk up to someone and say, hey, what'd you train for that body part? It looks amazing. What works best for them? 99% isn't going to work as good for you. What was that sort of like figuring out what worked best for your body? Because I always say, you know, like being a competitor, especially it's, it's a lot of trial and error and it's a lot of, you know, figuring out just what works best for you. Mm -hmm. I think 
over the past two years specifically, I focused a lot on progressive overload and that has been tried and true for any body part that I've been trying to grow. I've told a lot of people who compliment my shoulders. I'm like, my shoulders have taken the longest to grow. I've had to tweak my form multiple times. I've had to overcome injuries, focus on stretching. Um, And to that note, I think stretching is extremely underrated when it comes to growing muscle because you're contracting the muscle during your workouts. If you don't take time to stretch them, you're not going to get as much growth out of them. And so for me, it's just been the consistent heavy lifting Progressive overload style training. Um, I typically do eight to 12 week programs and then I take a deload and then start up either that same program again or I'll do a new program. Uh, My coach, John, does most of my programming for wellness. I've actually done a lot of my programming to focus on the glute growth that wellness requires. And that's been pretty fun. And I would say, like you said in the beginning, the gym is about 20% of the results. The discipline is 100%. You have to have discipline 100% no matter what part of your life it is. And the diet, nutrition, sleep, and stress management make up that remaining 80%. And so, yeah, you can be hitting your cardio. You can be hitting the gym and the workouts. But if you don't get your mental health straightened out, if you're not sleeping every night, if you're overdoing the cardio to almost punish yourself for a decision you made by eating a cheat meal that you shouldn't have, or you're overeating your carbs by a little bit. Those are the things that are going to add up to hurt somebody's physique, but more importantly, hurting their long-term health. Oh, 100%. I mean, I've had those moments too, where it's like, if I had a whole pizza instead and I'm just like, Oh my God, you know, I got to go do like two hours of cardio now. And the next thing you know, yeah, I've, we've, I think everyone's been through that, but it's, it's definitely a learning process, but that brings me into my most important thing is that, you know, this sport is so much more mental than it is physical. And so many people don't understand that, especially people looking on the outside, they look in on it and they're like, Oh, you know, this must just be, you know, Oh, they just got to get their workouts in. And it's good. But no, the mental side, cause I always, whenever people say that, I always sort of tell them, It's basically like you can convince your body to work out. I mean, that's the easy part, but just the mental side of waking up every day and going through the motions and doing all of that. What was that adjustment like for you? Because I bet that you probably weren't thinking that, hey, this is going to be so much more mental than physical when you were getting started in this. Mm -hmm. So I've always been a very goals driven person through high school to college to after college. And starting bodybuilding was just an add on to that where it was a new goal. But the goal didn't necessarily change. It was creating the system and the structures. And if you talk to any successful business person, any successful person out there, that's what they figure out is they figure out what system they create. And you've got to just keep doing that system over and over again. And I found out in the early part of my bodybuilding career that I was really good at following the system and the cycle. But if I didn't take time to let off the gas just a little bit, I would run out of gas and I would burn myself out. And even till today, right? There's certain times where I've got a lot of irons in the pot and I'll burn myself because I am literally trying to grab them all at once and not focusing on, okay, right now I'm focusing on the interview. I can think about the workout that's in four hours later. You don't have to think about it all at once, but you do need to have an organization and some type of plan as to how you're going to execute it. And that's where a lot of younger competitors or newer people in the sport, I think they need the most help is if they're not working with a coach, a lot of times they're going in blind or they're going in with a lot of free resources that you get online. Now, there's a lot, a lot of really good information out there, but how do you dissect it all? Because I mean, there's good information and then there's just the mediocre general information, but that's going to get you a mediocre physique. And so I have heard a lot of people say, well, you've got great genetics. I'm like, well, I didn't choose my genetics, but I know that I can capitalize on it with my work ethic, my training and my discipline. And so I try and help out, especially younger athletes, younger competitors, and I work when I coach people, I'm working mostly with lifestyle people, is that you're creating a system of behaviors and habits to reach that goal. 
but you won't reach that goal if those behaviors and habits don't align. I mean, I could not agree more that it's, I mean, I always like to tell the story of I was taking one of my finals in college and I was thinking about during the final, what my next workout was going to be. So I don't, I mean, if that's, the, that's just, you know, having, you really have to just compartmentalize things and it's just, yeah, this whole lifestyle. I mean, for some people, they just think of it as so foreign and so just so precise, but you know, it really has to be if you want to see long-term results, but we're talking about genetics and that's my favorite thing to talk about because I always say in this day and age of technology and social media where everyone's on Instagram and everyone's saying like, oh my God, I want her arms. I want his abs. I want their back. People don't realize that, you know, first of all, you don't know how they got that. You don't know if it's genetics. You don't know. And so many people just don't understand that you can only be the best version of yourself. But I always say whenever someone first gets started in the gym, they always have that one body part that really, really takes off because they don't have to train at all. And they have that one body part that just legs and they have to train it into oblivion. I mean, I'll give you mine first, my back, just because I had jobs all throughout college working in warehouses where you either got to realize back or you quit just loading trucks and stuff. But I'm 6'3", so my lower body is just absolutely shot where, I mean, I could train it. I could train it five times a week and it, and it wouldn't grow at all. I mean, I, I always say for my calves too, I could inject pure muscle into my calves and they wouldn't gain an ounce. I mean, it's, I'm just, I'm just, you know, I mean, luckily the gyms have been shut down. Well, they, they did recently open up, but I haven't gone back to them yet. I'm still working out at home, but I would have friends still who would just say, Hey Ryan, you plan working legs anytime this year? And it's like, you saw me train them yesterday. Come, come on guys. But what were those body parts for you when you were getting started? The ones that were stronger or weaker? Both. So my arms and my shoulders were the weaker, and I think they still kind of are for me. My abs, I've always had really good abs, strong abs. And, I mean, I grew up, I know, I know. <laughs> I did crunches. I did sit-ups and planks when I was younger. And my legs, I actually have always been lucky that it doesn't take a lot for them to grow. But I am, I'm 5'4". And I'm naturally more petite in my stature. So for me to do a squat or a deadlift, it's a little less, uh, you know, space for me to get that movement in and execute it properly. So it was funny because I think it was the Arnold a few years back. I actually saw Phil Heath. And one comment I'll never forget, he said to me, he's like, you've been in the squat rack, haven't you? And I was like, I'm definitely going to remember that compliment till the day I die. <laughs> Oh God. I don't, I, I mean, I could live 10,000 years. I don't think I'd ever get that compliment of I, Ryan, you've been in the squat rack. I mean, it would be, yeah. So, you know, that's why, that's why this is one of my, that's actually one of my least favorite questions to answer. Cause I was like, Oh my God. And then I had one of the ladies who was like, she put her calf up on the table that she was talking. I was like, get off my podcast. Like I'm done talking to you right now. This is, this is absolutely ridiculous, but <laughs> you know, I love asking that question because it does show, you know, so many people have so many different things. I mean, we've had one person that, you know, was the same person like me. And then we've had other people that, you know, like, Oh, my forearms were really, really really big when I was, and I was like, I don't even know how that, I mean, I don't even want to get into that, but it's, you know, it's just shows how different people are, but a myth and stereotype that I love to bust on this podcast. And I bet being a, being a coach and training, you know, lifestyle people, you hear this all the time. It's gotten better the last five years due to Instagram, but there are still so many women that have that fear that if they walk into the gym and they pick up one weight, they're going to put on 50 pounds of muscle overnight. And, you know, first of all, I always say to that, you know, I wish I had that type of self-confidence because I would be the Fortune 500 CEO by now, basically. And, you know, I would I would basically be running the world if I had that type of, but obviously it's, it's not the case. And I mean, uh, there's still so many people that have that fear, but did you ever have that fear when you were getting started? And even if you didn't have that fear, I mean, being that you probably still hear that a lot, how do you like to respond to that when you hear that? So I can't say that I was ever scared of putting on too much muscle, but it was more of the fear that my body was going to change in a way that I was not going to look feminine. And I will just be transparent. I think in the sport specifically, a lot of women have their own vision of what they want their body to be, or they've got this ideal person that they're like, I want my body to look like hers. And when you do that, you make changes to your programming or you make changes to your body so that that can happen. Now, one of the things that I think women, especially we compare ourselves a lot is with our breasts and our butts. And that's just how it is. And in bodybuilding, when you're losing your body fat, the first thing that usually goes is your chest. And so I actually have had two implants the first one, I ended up getting a contractual contraction. So that was the surgery. I had this spring 
was I had those replaced. And in doing so, it was like kind of like an inner, is this really how I want to look or am I just doing this for the sport? But obviously at the end of the day, a woman has to make the decision what's going to be making her most happy. And it's been over four years since I have had implants in, I couldn't picture myself without implants. And so I think that's just one thing that women think you have to have implants to compete. Not true. They think you have to have a big butt or a tiny waist to compete. That's not true. You need to show up every single day with the idea that I'm going to make my body better than it was yesterday. I'm going to be stronger than I was yesterday. And in doing so, I'm doing this for me and not for somebody else. That I think is the biggest thing. You can't go out there. I just want to prove this to so-and-so. I just want to make my coach proud. But if you're not enjoying the process, why are you doing it? Yeah. I mean, I, I couldn't have said it better myself. So many people, you know, they, they, you know, it's either if it's like a revenge body or if it's other, or it's other aspects too. They don't, they just don't, they just feel shallow and empty on the side then when the, when they're done with the competition because they're like, wow, I put myself through all this just for just for that, basically, where it's like, yeah, you have to have your the right motivation and the right drive for it. Not, not saying that you can't do it without it, but it's just – it makes things so much easier. But going off that, I mean, I always say the one thing that I think impacts especially women so much more positively, the working out aspect, is the confidence boost that it gives you. I mean, we have heard hundreds of stories on this podcast of women who have – you know, either made life changing decisions or just help them just with their overall life. And I always say that's the one thing that you can take from the gym and use to impact every single aspect of your life is that confidence boost. How have you taken that and used that to impact your life as well? I would definitely agree that it's a huge confidence booster. And growing up, I was always in a male dominant industry. Agriculture is a male dominant industry. That's what I did. And I wasn't used to anything different. And so once I started going into the gym regularly, starting to lift weights, it's really interesting because now I reflect back, it really brought out more of that ego within me. And it's an increase in testosterone, right? When any a male or a female is lifting weights, your increased testosterone it happens. And I think as that happens, the woman she can have that opportunity to use that as a confidence booster in a positive way, or you end up in the egotistical, not so positive way. So that's where it's kind of like the industry, you can see the segmentation if you really observe it and you study it. That, And this is where I think the sport has a lot of opportunity is more and more people are telling how bodybuilding has changed their lives and the positive influences it's had. And not just focusing on themselves, but how what you learned and what you're overcoming can help somebody else along the way. AKA, that's one of the reasons why I started this podcast, too, is just to have people helping, you know, spread their awareness. And yeah, that's so great, too. And I believe me, so my dad grew up in a small farming town of about 200 people. So I know exactly what you're talking about, where I was like, I have not seen whenever we drive back there, too. It's like, I do not see one woman, I don't think, ever doing. I mean, it's so, yeah, it's just such a male dominated field. So I, I totally understand that. But now we go to the million dollar question because if, I mean, if I were to have guessed out of all the things that I would have thought that these guests would struggle with the most, Posing would be probably at the bottom of my list. I never would have guessed in a million years that for so many of these athletes that posing is, you know, more, it's harder for them than their nutrition. It's harder than they're working out. But I like to compare it now to like being a perfect driver where you can be a great driver. You can never be a perfect driver. You can be a great poser. You can never be a perfect poser. It's always ever evolving. What is your experience with posing been like? <laughs> it's been interesting to say the least. When I first started bodybuilding, my posing was atrocious and it's like you're trying to overthink it and the simpler that you can make it. And when you work with a coach, if they can simplify it for you, I think that's where it makes it so much easier. Um, I would also say that just like comparing to like a pro football player, they watch tapes of different teams play. They watch these different plays so that they can figure out, okay, is this what I want to do? Or can I tweak it for me? How do I make this work for me? That I think is the value of posing is if you can start studying these people that you really like their posing and you figure out, okay, 
I really like that transition to the back. Now I'm going to try it. I'm going to record myself. What does it look like? Maybe I have a little bit more roundness in my upper glute. How can I make that pop differently than what she had? Or, you know, I don't like this at all. What can I do that is maybe totally off the whim, but it fits within the category? That's, I think, the beauty of this sport because essentially bodybuilding is appreciating the art of the body. So when you're on stage, your job is to make your body look like a work of art. You need to look confident. If you're a male, you want to look masculine, but you also want to have that beauty appeal. If you're a female, you want to look feminine, but you have that feminine strength and that beauty within you. That's why we get our hair and makeup done and we have jewelry on. It's At the end of the day, it's a beauty contest with muscles. So when you practice your posing, and I practice posing every single day. Even, okay, off season, I don't practice every day, just to be fair. But I do practice in the off season because I know it's going to better me in the long run. And since I help people with posing, I want to learn different techniques and I want to study different things that might help somebody else. And I would say over the past year to year and a half has been the biggest learning curve for me from a posing standpoint. I've worked, I think, with over 10 different posing coaches myself to just learn. And from there, that's helped me transfer some of that to the clients that I work with. I work mostly with younger, newer athletes to help them with their posing and their presentation. Because at the end of the day, it's not just about the quarter turns, but how do you walk? How do you flip your hair? What's your smile like? All of those things matter. So it's super fun for me to help people with posing. And to your point, is literally the icing on the cake. And if you go to a restaurant and they tell you they're going to bring out this duck confit and you're thinking, oh, this is going to be so good. And they bring it out and it's like all mashed up and you're like, that doesn't look like duck confit. You're like, okay, do I want this? That's exactly how it is. If you have a physique, you cut down, you condition down, you raise up on stage, but you don't know how to present your body to the judges the best way you can. It's not going to look good to them. They aren't going to want to pick you as their first choice off the menu. I've always said you could be the most in shape person on the planet. And, you know, if you don't know how to pose, you know, good luck to you. I mean, it's not, it's not going to happen, but being that you work with a lot of people who are just getting started in posing, what would you say is probably the biggest uh, detriment that they have, or what's the biggest struggle for them when it comes to starting, starting out posing? I think most of my younger athletes who are just starting posing, the hardest thing for them is thinking that they have to flex or tighten up the muscles so hard when they're in the pose. A lot of the poses are extremely simple and fluid. And yeah, you're going to open your muscles up a certain way, but it's not like when you're at the gym and you're like chasing a pump, you're only wanting to flex and pose, if you will about 40%. And the longer you're on stage, the more and more you're going to increase that and your muscles are going to harden through that process. Yeah. I've seen so many times where I was like, is that person about to pass out because they're flexing so hard? And I'm just like, okay, they're not. And just like I always say with the the one biggest thing with posing too, is like the human body is not meant to be in that flex of a state for that long of a period of time. So yeah, you kind of do have to spread out. But since you are the first wellness athlete that we've had on, what is the difference in posing between a wellness athlete and a figure athlete? Is there any at all? There's very much so. I would compare wellness more towards the bikini division. And I'll tell you a little bit why. So when they first announced wellness, a lot of people were just on the impression it was about bigger legs. Well, As we start to see more and more, and I started to study the top pros in Europe and Brazil to see what their physiques looked like. So I watched several judges online, um, different competitions like the Arnold Brazil to see what they were actually doing. And as you start to evaluate these physiques, these women are very conditioned and their lower bodies are very muscular. And as you start to see this more and more in the U S it's going to be interesting as the division unfolds a little bit to see, you know, what the standard is going to be here. But when they're in the poses, you're going to start off with a front pose. That's very similar to a bikini front pose. 
but showing off the quads. So in bikini, they don't really want bigger quads, but in wellness, you want to have balanced quads to glute and hamstrings, not overpowering quads. I think that's going to be a misnomer that women are thinking they need big quads. Well, they have to be balanced. So then you rotate into the side, first side pose. This is where it's a little bit similar to figure is you need to show your lat. They want to see lat taper and they want to see some taper from your shoulder down to your glute. It needs to have curvature there. And that's where having a smaller waist can really be an advantage or making your posing look good where you have a smaller waist ratio. And then in the back pose, of course, is similar to the bikini, um, just showing your glute ham tie-ins and you want to see quad sweep from the back as well as shapely calves. Then you do another side pose and you're pretty much done. So I think the conditioning of wellness, I'm leaning more towards a figure in that. And the few shows that we've seen in the U.S. so far because of COVID, most of the women who are winning have similar to figure conditioning level. They were saying bikini in the beginning, but we'll see. As more competitors come out, the judges might pick the softer look. We don't really know. I just think a lot of women are going to try and come into a show softer, but I think it's going to be a benefit to come into a show drier and more conditioned. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I just think since it's just starting to get figured out, I mean, people, it's going to take a while to really figure things out. And yeah, just like with anything else in the sport too, I mean, it all depends on the judges too. I mean, you can just have a different set of judges and a completely different result, but you brought up coronavirus and I was just about to ask that too, because I mean, it's been something that's impacted us so much and especially in the health and fitness community where, I mean, gyms have been closed and people have really been struggling on ways to, uh, you know, how still to still, you know, get their workouts in. What has that been like for you sort of figuring out, you know, hey, I, you know, obviously I'm still going to get ready for a show and stuff, but I know in Georgia, because we had another guest from Georgia on, they opened up the gyms, you know, a while back or so, but even before then, how are you still getting those workouts in? Was it a struggle for you? And I know that you were just getting done with that surgery in the springtime too. So what was that like for you during that whole time period? This whole year has been interesting for me. I just got married in March as well. So I literally had surgery in January. And then got what, married what day in March. March was it? Was it like right before everything shut down or was it before that? Yeah, we got married the day before Trump announced everything closed. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so we were lucky. Um, and then when that happened, that's when we hadn't booked a honeymoon or anything. We were already planning to wait for a honeymoon. But we um, I have always had the mentality that a winner has that goal but they're able to modify the plan to achieve the goal. And so there were a lot of people who were super worked up about not getting to the gym and that they weren't going to have gains and they were going to lose all their progress. They're going to get fat. And it's like, okay, if you're going to tell yourself that it's probably going to come true. But if you can't have the discipline to hold yourself to focusing on your goal and not letting the external factors affect you, you need to do some self-work as well. And I've had to do that too. I think the biggest thing for me was I started doing some outside workouts. Um, it was only a week or so that I had to because we had a private gym we started training at. And my husband's a bodybuilder as well. So for both of us, it's a priority. And I think that's what this whole COVID situation has helped people realize what their life priorities are. And it's been very beneficial for people because, you know, there's some families out there who weren't focused on family. They would make time to go to work, go to the gym and come home, but they weren't really making time for family. And I think this has been a huge eye opener for people to sit, say, no, I'm going to compromise on this because I want to spend time on B instead of A. And so for bodybuilding, it's always been a high priority for me. At one point, I considered not competing this year, but in the same sense, my goal was to wait until the fall to step on stage anyways. So I was like, okay, I'm just going to keep training and eating like I am, follow my coach's plan, and he modified some things to lower calories when I needed to, and if we were pushing hard in the gym, we increased the calories accordingly, and you know, you go from there. And I think that's the mentality that most people in the sport 
who are high level athletes, that's what they focus on is, you know, if you're at a busy gym, your machine's taken, are you going to pout and like have a little fit that your machine's taken? Or are you going to modify it and be, you know, methodical and thinking, okay, so that Smith machine's taken, what equipment can I do instead that's very similar movement to help me get this workout in? And I think COVID in general, it's been one of these years that, you know, people have had to figure out, maybe it's time I take a longer off season and put my health first and put my family first. Or maybe somebody like me, they're like, well, I could compete. Maybe this is the year to compete, especially for me going into a new division. I felt like this was the time that I could really step on a stage and shine even after everything that's going on. So it's really up to the individual to figure out, you know, what are your life priorities and how do you make them a priority? And if your long-term health for you, whether it's bodybuilding or not, is a priority, you're going to get workouts in and you're going to make do with what you got. I know several people reached out to me on Instagram because I posted about working out in the gym and they were like, well, I still don't have a gym. I'm like, okay. I know several people who are buying bands on Amazon. You're buying weights off Craigslist. And they would just keep giving me these excuses. Oh, shipping's too long. Oh, that's going to take me too much effort to go across state lines to pick it up. And it's like, okay, I'm not going to argue with you if that's how you feel about it. I'm just trying to give you solutions. But at the end of the day, you choose where your energy goes and your energy flows. I mean, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And also, I mean, you have hormone health on for your list that you coach on. And that is one of, especially for females, the most important things. I mean, for guys, we hear that and we're like, what, what, what is that basically? But you know, it's something that we are, I mean, being a guy, I am blessed that I do not have to deal with. And I cannot imagine what that must be like. So, you know, I, I usually just don't, but I mean, it's one thing that we've heard so many stories on here. I mean, people don't realize how, you know, especially for women, when you're dieting down and stuff, your hormones get affected so much. And what's that journey been like from for you sort of trying to balance things out? Because I mean, it's for being a female in the sport. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that you have to worry about that men have no clue about. So I will add to your point, Ryan, that men do have to worry about their hormones. So eventually you might need to get blood work done. But <laughs> that's neither here nor there. I'll, I'll, I'll be one of those ignorant men that's like, no, I, I never have to. No, but I know what you're saying. But yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> but just, I, I've met too many of those guys who are just like, I, I don't care. Whatever, whatever happens. And it's like, OK, good luck being dead at 50 then. But, you know, you know, good, good luck on your journey. But yeah, I know. But it's for women. I think they just pay more attention to it. That's what I, that's what I think I was meaning to say. Yeah. yeah, no worries. I just wanted to point it out because I think there's a lot of male coaches who know little to nothing about female hormones and they'll prescribe women to take PEDs and they'll prescribe them to take certain things that are not really supposed to be in a female body. Now to be a top level athlete, sometimes you have to make sacrifices that way. So for me, I actually have had PCOS and this was in the very beginning of my bodybuilding journey. I lost my period when I was still in a maintenance phase. And my first coach, she's like, well, you can go see a gynecologist, but you're eating plenty of food, so I don't know what's wrong. Well, I go to the gynecologist. They say the same thing over and over again. Well, you look fine. Your pap smear came back fine. Do you want to be put on birth control? <laughs> Why do I want to be on birth control? At that time, I wasn't even sexually active. And my period was fine. You're going to cramp. Normally, most women do. and it was." you know, fairly regular. And then I lost it. And that's when they asked, do you want me to put on birth control? I'm like, no, there's nothing wrong with me. And I'm not trying to prevent pregnancy. So I don't need artificial hormones. Well, it spanned for about two years that I got a couple gynecologists and I hadn't had blood work done at the time, but I ended up self-diagnosing amenorrhea, which is the absence of your period for over six months, and PCOS, and ended up stemming it to an insulin sensitivity issue. And a lot of women don't think about that because in sports specifically, you know, if you're carb cycling or you're changing up your nutrient intake, women crave sugar. 
And sugar becomes an addictive substance to the brain, especially the more that you add it in. And I love sugar. Growing up, I'd love to bake. I still love to bake, but I make healthier versions now. And that was something that really affected me. And when I started getting ready for um, not my first time doing junior USAs, but the second go around, I knew that I had to bring in a better physique and wanted to supplement that. But I also wanted to be mindful of what impact or effects that I could have negatively from any type of adjustment I make to my supplementation. So I make sure I get blood work done, but any female that I talk to or I work with, if they're a bodybuilder or not, I want to make sure that they know where their hormone levels are. If they're having consistent regular periods, if they're having regular stool every day or certain times of the week, what their mood swings are like and what their sleep is like. And then the other thing on top of that is how much extra stress are you putting on your body with cardio sessions or extreme heavy training? There's a lot of women in CrossFit. There's a lot of women in gymnastics, ice skating. You're doing so much cardio on your body. Marathoners, they lose their periods. And it's because it becomes a stressor on the body. Now, we can have good stress. Cortisol is important. It helps us with muscle building. But when you don't balance it out and you don't learn your own body, that's where we really get in trouble. And I think for any woman, any man, the more in tune you can become with your body from the biofeedback that you get, the better off you're going to be. And you are going to be the only one who can really dictate how your body is and know what's going on. A coach who's miles away in a different state, they can kind of know. You can send them blood work and they can kind of tell you what's going on. But at the end of the day, you have to become so self-aware. And I think that's where us bodybuilders, we become so self-aware of, oh, there's a pain there. It has to be stemming from this. Or, oh, that's not happening. It must be because I did this two days ago. Like we know that there's something wrong because of the root cause, but we have to be able to diagnose those root causes. And sometimes we can't do it ourselves. So we have to start learning it through self-education, through doctors, other resources out there to educate ourselves enough that we can make that a priority. And I can't stress that enough because so many women specifically in the sport today, they want to have short term results. We talked about this in the beginning. They're rushing, 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 rushing to get to a stage, to go pro, to become next Olympian. And what are you going to have to show for it in five years when your hair is falling out, when you have no estrogen, when you're trying to have a baby and your fertility is down the tubes? Is that a priority for you? So one person that if you've heard of her, I'm sure many of your listeners have, is Victoria Felker. She preaches about steroids and bodybuilding all the time about the effects of weight training for women, effects of dieting for women, all these things add up. And these are the things that I think are going to make or break the industry, especially as we continue to see the changes with women having to look leaner for certain divisions to win. We're having women's bodybuilding coming back. I think that'll be great for the sport. And especially because of how women's physique has gotten so lean. I'm hoping that we see everything take a step back to what it used to be in 2008, 2009. Now it might take a little bit, but that is what's going to help this sport. And only us competitors and coaches, if we continue to talk about this and we unite on this, are going to make the change. If we don't show up a certain look on stage, the judges won't have any other reason but to pick somebody who might be a little bit softer than they were six months ago. But that's just part of the process, right? I mean, I have seen a handful of, you know, like these young, like 20, 21, 22 women who have like 16 inch arms. And I'm just like, Oh, I was just like, oh, 10 years. Like, I just, I mean, I mean, again, I don't knock anyone for doing anything like that just because I know it's, it's none of my business and stuff, but it's just like, I mean, we've, I've seen some of those, those horror stories like later on in life. And it's just, you know, you really gotta, I mean, and again, 
I, I always say my generation, everyone wants everything now and they want it yesterday where it's, I mean, that's, that's another thing that people have to deal with. But I mean, if we're talking about, especially recovery in this sport and I mean, one of the things too with bodybuilding and I equate it to a lot of other sports too, is that when you're constantly training and working out, it sometimes becomes very hard for you to notice the difference between pain and injury, which is one thing that, I mean, all these, every football coach I've ever had in my entire life, you guys need to know the difference between pain and injury. I don't want anyone sitting out, you know, if you're just a little bit sore from a thing. So that's a, that's a whole different spiel, but especially when it comes to recovery, I mean, you mentioned it before and it is the number one thing sleep. I mean, so many people do not understand that. I have suffered through that as well. I mean, I remember my college days, some all-nighters that I pulled, and, you know, the next day trying to go and work out lasted about 20 minutes. And then I'm like, okay, yep, this this isn't happening. But, I mean, it is so, so important. I mean, I take melatonin now to really, really help me get the proper amount. But what is the recommended amount that you try to get yourself? And what are some tips and tricks that you that you might use? Because, I mean, so many people, especially with technology – Sleep still to me too. It eludes me on a lot of days. Well, it shouldn't say eludes me, but it's hard for me to get that proper amount. So sleep in itself is a very detailed topic and it does vary per person. I've read several books about sleep. One that I can recommend to people is called Why We Sleep. And essentially, you know, most people on average should be getting at least six to eight hours of sleep. Women actually need more sleep than men. And I know that for me, like in the middle of a prep, like right now, my sleep is awful. Like I feel like I'm tossing and turning all night. Now, granted, I am taking fat burning stimulants and caffeine. And usually that has an eight hour half life. So if you're drinking a cup of coffee at two o'clock, it's not gonna be out of your system until 10 p.m. So for everybody who loves to take monsters or doing energy drinks right before the gym at 7 p.m., your body is going to have to get that out of your system before you're going to be able to fall asleep. So that's rule number one for me, Ryan is making sure that I don't take caffeine after two o'clock. If I, my workouts, I work out in the evening. So around five to 6 PM, I'll do like a pump stimulant. Um, it's a non, a non stim pump formula just to get blood flow and some nutrients into that. But other than that, I won't do caffeine. If you are exhausted and you need to take a nap, take a nap. I think taking a 30 minute power nap, there's been several studies that actually 20 minutes is about the optimal nap time that somebody should get. That can be similar to a full night's rest and recovery. Meditation can actually help people feel just as refreshed as a full night's sleep. Um, I am very sensitive to like melatonin, valerian root. There are some really good blends out there. But you need to just figure out what your dosing is, dosage is because it can keep you up at night. So for me, like I can't go over, I believe it's like two grams and then I'm like wired. It doesn't help me sleep, but that's something too. like if you want to have some type of natural herbs, valerian root, magnesium is great to take before bed. Um, melatonin is naturally produced in our body, but you can add a little bit more to help with that as well making sure you're sleeping in a cooler environment. So below 68 degrees, the optimal is about 66 degrees to have your house, but they say it's just your head that needs to be that cool. So as long as under the blankets, like you can be warm, but your head needs to be cooler in order to get more of a deep sleep. NREM and REM are two different sleep cycles. And you really want to make sure that your REM cycle, you're going to be getting that deeper restorative sleep as you were talking about. And those are just a few of the things that can help with sleep. And actually, here's probably the most important, getting off of our phones and our screens at least an hour before bed. And I know it's hard for all of us because I love watching Netflix and chilling before bed too, but I don't keep a TV in my bedroom. I don't bring my computer in the bedroom. Um, The only electronic will be my phone for an alarm clock. And I don't even like doing that, but I haven't bought a $10 alarm clock from Walmart just because I'm being lazy. If I'm being honest. <laughs> I'm, I mean, I've had times editing these podcasts where I look at the clock. And it's like, Oh my God, it's 4am. I should probably go to bed right now, but okay. So this is a tangent little story time that, that to deal. This is my experience with caffeine one time where I was, so I've been furloughed from UPS because of the coronavirus. I'll be back there in September. But I mean, I was a supervisor of airline shipping. So that was, I mean, we had, horrible hours and this was during peak season which i mean 
So I'm just going to say this out loud. Anytime you, you guys are ordering stuff for Christmas or New Year's or any holiday, just remember about the poor souls like me that have to worry about all that. So next time you think about ordering little Timmy or little or little Johnny, you know, his little, you know, wooden horse or whatever you guys are ordering nowadays, just think of me. But so we, they called me up and it, it needed to be an 18 hour shift. So I was like, oh God, how am I going to be able to stay awake for this? So I concocted the easy and, you know, totally sane plan of, Okay, I had two five-hour energies and two monsters. I chugged one of the five-hour. I chugged one of the five-hour energies. Then I chugged one of the monsters, and this was within like two minutes of each other. Then I chugged half of the last monster, and then I put the five-hour energy into the monster and shook it up with my thumb over the container, and then I chugged it. And I posted about it on Snapchat because I had to be up for eighteen hours. And I had one of my friends who's literally a nurse. She's like, "You are going to die. Like, you might need to get medical attention right now." I was like, oh, "I'll be fine, whatever." So the first three hours of the shift, everything was going smoothly. I was, you know, energetic. And then all of a sudden, my stomach and my heart were just boom, 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 boom. And I was like, "Oh God, this is what she's talking about." Long story short, I was in the bathroom for about an hour, and um, I probably lost a good ten, fifteen pounds. At, at, at least, at least, like it was bad. And then like, I still finished my work, but like literally I, yeah, that was, so everybody make sure that, you know, are safe with your, with especially the caffeine and stuff, because I know a lot of bodybuilders do take a lot of caffeine too, to, because I mean, some, some of them really struggle with sleep and it's, it's, it's a big thing, but yeah, that is my, that is my cautionary tale that I like to tell at least one of those per podcast. But lastly, I mean, my number one enemy on this entire planet is cardio. I mean, I could not stress, I mean, it's, I mean, I, I did like 80 minutes of cardio last night, but when I say cardio, I mean walking. So I, so I walked, so I walked like seven miles in like 80 minutes just to have something to do during this. But I, so I used to have an ex-girlfriend who's, who, like you said, was a gymnast and their conditioning is just absolutely insane. And ever since she stopped gymnastics, she decided to become a marathon runner. Oh, Ryan, you want to come out for a run with me? No, I'm good. I, I, I just don't, oh, I'm going to go on like an eight, nine mile run. I'll be back in a couple of hours. And it's like, oh, we'll have fun with that. You know, I, I'm, you're not, I'm not going to come out there. So I, I know that from firsthand experience, but what is your relationship with cardio like? Because for, it's like half and half for a lot of the guests that I have on. Mm -hmm. So it's funny because in general, every prep that I've had has been different. And I used to love HIIT training. And I think that was actually part of my issue with my PCOS was I was overstressing my body with too much cardio. So now I really enjoy lists, just like walking, like you said, keeping a general pace. I wear a heart rate monitor to monitor what my heart rate's at, to know how many steps I'm getting in in a day. Uh, right now in prep, I'm doing six days of cardio a week for an hour, but it's chill. I mean, it's not like I'm feeling like I'm dying at the end. And every person is going to be different for what their prep's going to be like or their fat loss progress is going to be like. Some people might have to do like a 15 minute hit training session once a week or twice a week to really increase that metabolic rate and see fat burning results. But in the same sense, they might see less and be holding more water because their body is feeling stressed. So I, I actually enjoy doing treadmill or elliptical is my favorite. We've got a stationary bike actually right here. So if I want to hop on the bike at 5.30 in the morning instead of going to walk outside, I can just do that instead. But I've actually – so you can kind of include this in cardio, I think. I've enjoyed yoga and doing more of a relaxing type of yoga sessions as an added stretch recovery on my off days from training. But I think cardio in general for people's long-term health you got to add in some type of cardiovascular activity. We live a sedentary lifestyle. Like even us right now, I could be standing to do this podcast, but I sat down. Why? I don't know. But that's something that we can just think about more is how do I just stand up more often, stretch my legs more often, get in those steps, if you will, and neat. I forget the what the abbreviation is for, but just adding in that uh, it's non-exercise exertion time how much, you know, you can do in a day that's not really part of your cardio, but even just walking around a grocery store, walking from the parking lot to wherever you're stopping at, getting in those extra steps, it can add up. And there's a lot of competitors now who kind of preach on that is like, it's not just your cardio session that matters, but that will compound throughout the day, depending on what your activities are like and what your food intake's like. 
Well, I can tell her that, I mean, I had a podcast right before I talked to her, and I have two more after I'm done with her, so you can bet your butt that I'll be on that, that treadmill for another 80 minutes tonight, because I only do 80 minutes, too, because that's 10,000 steps, really, that's how long it takes me, so I, as long as I get those 10,000 steps in, but yeah, that cardio, I mean, I, and I'm and i fine doing that, like, the walk on the treadmill, too, just because I usually have a movie playing, and I time it out, usually, so I almost watch, you know, like, the entire movie, so I don't know what I'll be watching tonight, that's always an adventure, just, sometimes that's taken me, like, an extra half hour to get on the treadmill, because I'm literally just scrolling through like oh what movies do i want to watch that i think i'd be able to watch for a full time without you know just getting you know not wanting to watch anymore so that's a struggle too but the last few questions before we wrap things up here i mean if someone were to walk up to you and say you know caroline we made the decision you can change one thing about the sport of bodybuilding and everyone would go along with it what would be one thing that you would like to see changed mm-hmm. that's our million dollar question here that's a, that's our big stumper that we usually have a lot yeah mm-hmm. One thing to change about bodybuilding. While you're thinking, I can give you mine. Go ahead. Okay, so for me, one of the bigger, I mean, there's, there's obviously, there's two things, but they kind of come together. First of all, the money thing, because a lot of people don't understand that these people are not making money doing bodybuilding. You are losing money. So, I mean, if you really want to promote a more healthy and fit lifestyle, I think to the general public, you might want to give more incentive to these competitors. Although I will say I am nervous. Like if they ever announce like, oh, in two years, the winner is going to win $10 million from this one show, the extremes that people would go to, that, that would be very, very unhealthy. But just just that too. And then also... I mean, the fact that every show is different, too. I mean, you could have one set of judges that are looking for a different look and then another set of judges that are looking for a different... I mean, you could go to... I always said you could do shows in back-to-back weeks. You could place first in one and last in the next. In the next. It all depends on what the judges are looking for. So just that they could have more of a universal model of what they're looking for, too, would really be one thing that I'd like to see, too. Mm-hmm. I think in general, and this goes back to... I think the whole theme of our conversation is on the women's health side is I'd like to see more women who are speaking out about their stories and how bodybuilding has been a catalyst to healthy life choices or improving their lives. I know several women in the sport who have gone through abusive relationships. They've gone through um, assaults. They've had just negative experiences in their lives. And then the gym became their sanctuary. And they became disciplined with their eating and they created this lifestyle that not only drew drew them to be more competitive and to better themselves every day, but in the same sense, and this is where I think we can do better about it, is having more women to be spokesmodels for the sport besides the ones that look like bikini models, right? Because bodybuilding at the end of the day should be about building muscle too, but if we don't talk about it, the same perception is going to be out there. They're going to just be thinking, oh, well, these girls are starving themselves. Well, you don't know half of the story, and here's why. And this is what the sport has done for me. And this is what I've been able to see my friend Sue be able to accomplish through bodybuilding. And so I think there needs to be more of the conversation happening outside of just like our podcast today, right? These things need to be talked about at shows. We need to have more options for press interviews. We need to have it in magazines and online blogs. We need to be talking more positive about the sport so that it can continue to grow. And I think even with this COVID going on, we are going to see fewer competitors this year. The whole sport's hurting, just like all other industries out there. So I think it's an opportunity for us to kind of pull back a little bit, reevaluate what direction is the sport going in. And if it's not something that we want to see long term, this is an opportunity to redirect it. And we can help people by redirecting it in a way that's going to reach more people and specifically getting more women, more men involved with the sport. And I think that's where wellness comes in. It's a new division. They brought in classic physique how many years ago? That division's exploded, and it's just creating more opportunity. We're giving more people the opportunity to see that bodybuilding is more than just physical looks, that bodybuilding is not a selfish sport, but it has opportunity to do good. And to your point, if there's more opportunity to compensate monetarily for not the athletes always, but even just getting more donations, getting more sponsors, getting more coaches to donate and say, 
you know, I had how many competitors at the show, I'm going to donate X amount of dollars so that the organization can do this. And we just need more collaboration. Well, I was going to say, like, even if you look back in the day, ESPN used to have the bodybuilding shows on all at, all the time. Like in the 90s, it's like, especially during coronavirus, there have been shows since then. And ESPN is, instead of ha- instead of having these videos of athletes playing like NBA 2K17 or whatever like that, maybe you might want to go to like actual sporting events. So I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there. I mean, it may be a little bit too, you know... It may be a little too severe of a request for some people, but it's like, go to, go to a body. I mean, it's, there's just so many ways that they could make it bigger. And, you know, I do think it is getting bigger, you know, and maybe with coronavirus. Yeah. We're seeing a lot of, a lot of the guests that I've talked to are taking the year off, but some of them are getting ready too. So it's really going to be interesting what we're going to see. But I mean, Caroline, I cannot thank you enough for coming on and for, you know, sharing your story and talking. I mean, you're one of my favorite guests because, first of all, I had to do the least amount of talking possible, which is always good for me. It's always, it's always, it's always good for the old throat, you know, so I don't have to, you know, stress myself out too much. I mean, I, if I could have a guest like you on for every single time, believe me, I would. But I'll leave a link to her Instagram page down below and also her link tree where you can go and, you know, follow her everywhere. And if, you know, if you need, if you need you know, posing advice or lifestyle coach, definitely look into that and look into her. I mean, I highly, highly recommend it. And Caroline, thank you so much for coming on. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Ryan. And hopefully this helps some women and men athletes out there and even those who are new to the sport. Absolutely. And just like if any advice I could give anyone to, I mean, I'm basically this is named DD on the spot because in college I was known as the designated driver a lot. So then that's what that's why that's where the DD comes from. But I'm honestly just thinking about renaming this podcast trial and error, because if that's the one thing for any (laughs) any prospective bodybuilders out there, you're going to need a lot of. So, yeah, I mean, and again, it's great conversation. And lastly, do you have anyone that you'd like to give a shout out to before we wrap things up? Uh, I would just say thank you to everybody who's been a part of my journey. I've got a great community online from Instagram and Facebook and also my Twitter, I'm trying to grow and my uh, website, but my husband, David Dimasquita, his dynamite D on Instagram has been my rock the past. We've been together almost four years now. Um, we started bodybuilding separately before we knew each other. But uh, then my coach, John Meadows, Mountain Dog One, and one of my sponsors for my suit, Kitty's Bikinis, she does amazing suits and she's getting ready to do my first wellness suit. So all you girls out there who need some type of competition suit from bikini to wellness or women's physique, she's got your back. But I obviously can't name everybody. There's so many people who've touched my life, especially in the sport. And I couldn't be more grateful for everybody, especially during a time where we're seeing more disconnect. We need to be unified as a community. And this sport has so much diversity and Black Lives Matters. And we just need to be united together. So I hope that this podcast or this podcast and others out there can continue to unite others through the sport. Well, just even getting into that too, just lastly, I mean, I'm 12 minutes away from where that George Floyd thing happened really. Oh, wow. For it, so yeah, I've been feeling that a lot. I mean, I, yeah, it's, that's a whole, I'm just going to do a whole podcast on that separately. Like I, I'm not going to get into that, but it's just, yeah, it's been, it's been like, I, like my, like my uh, friends always say, God, what a time to be alive. But you know, it's, there's time for change and stuff like that. And I do got to ask though, what is, what was your maiden name before, uh, before you had to change it? Wild. So it's German W E I H L. I go from one name to another. It's fine. Uh, yeah, I know, no, I know. Just call I'm, me I'm, strong, I'm, sweet Caroline, and you're good. Oh, oh, and plus, like, me, I've never had to deal with that in my life. Ryan Johnson. No one is ever going to ever get that wrong. Some people might be like, Brian, and I was like, how do you get that out of Ryan? But, you know, hey, it's it's a different thing. But again, Caroline, we cannot thank you enough for coming on. And this is Ryan Johnson, DD on the spot, signing out. Have a great day, everyone. <laughs>